I'm Jeff. Uh, here's how you can contact me. Um, the, on Twitter, uh, this is a personal Twitter feed, so uh, it will contain both security things and cat videos. Um, I've been with Android security for uh, about two years now. Um, yeah, and on Android, I focus mostly on system hardening. Um, sometimes that involves the kernel, other times it doesn't, and I'm a software engineer. Uh, so we're gonna be discussing uh, mostly kernel bugs um, that we've been seeing over the last couple years. Uh, but before we get too much into kernel bugs, we have some good news. Um, the first is that most of the kernel bugs that we're going to be discussing today were not directly reachable by untrusted code uh, due to Android security model. Uh, so if you wanted to reach one of these bugs, you'd have to chain exploits uh, and gain privilege in a, in a um, more privileged process. Uh, and then we've substantially cut down on that, e even that attack surface in Android Nougat. Um, and then the other piece of really good news uh, that kind of ties into um, some of the work coming from the kernel self-defense project is that some of the new defenses that are being added address our biggest category of kernel bugs. Uh, so the next piece of uh, good news is that uh, the kernel only represents one of many lines of defense. And a, a lot of the other efforts uh, on Android are focused on preventing malicious code from ever, ever reaching your Android device. Okay, let's uh, get into some kernel bugs. So for our agenda, we're gonna discuss, we're gonna look at kernel bugs, we're gonna discuss the cause of kernel bugs, so um, in other words, we're gonna categor categorize them by type. Uh, we're gonna look at the reachability of kernel bugs, and then we're gonna discuss mitigations, uh, both by cause and reachability, and then gaps, and then we'll also look at some future work. Let's see here. So, uh, first to note, so uh, other people have been hammering on this, but uh, I feel I would do the same, which is that kernel bugs have a long life. And uh, simply finding and fixing kernel bugs is, is not adequate. Um, some devices may never get patched, and when a bug is reported to the upstream kernel, uh, it's likely not the first time that that bug has been discovered. So who knows who else knows about that bug, how long they've known about that bug, and how they've been using it. Uh, so we need to look at uh, beyond just finding and fixing bugs and into an ecosystem that's resilient against security vulnerabilities. Um, Yeah, so we, we have a lot of people that are looking at bugs, and so we want to make better use of their time uh, rather than just playing whack-a-mole on bugs. We also want to use this data to prioritize mitigation development and adoption, and so that's what this talk is really gonna be about, is let's look at bugs and let's use that data to then prioritize uh, the work that's going on. Uh, so a little bit about our data set. So it includes bugs from all of 2014, all of 2015, and up through April of this year. It includes low, moderate, high, and critical severity uh, vulnerabilities. Um, so as a side note, mo you could reconstruct most of this data from Nexus security bulletins, uh, they can, which contain moderate through critical vulnerabilities. Uh, so I've included the low severity bugs here for a couple reasons. Uh, the first is that um, our severity ratings may change over time. So things that were considered low previously may no longer be considered, could for example be considered moderate now. The other reason is that, and this is the more important reason, which is that the reachability of bugs is considered in our severity ratings. Uh, so bugs that are only reachable to a privileged process will receive a lower severity rating than bugs that are reachable uh, by for example third party apps. So, uh, but the location and cause of these bugs, even though they, they're not reachable, uh, is, are still useful data points for us to consider. Uh, so I've included them here. 
Um, and then the kernel is of interest because um, it provides many of the security um, uh, features that, that Android relies on. So these security features include uh, the basic application sandboxing that's an ess essential part of Android's security model, uh, and, and also the other security features here. Uh, in fact, the security features provided to user space by the kernel uh, have been so effective that they're increasingly making the kernel itself uh, really the only viable target. So uh, our data actually reflects that. Um, these, so if you look by year, um, you can see that uh, the ratio of kernel bugs to user space bugs is increasing. Um, so yeah, th there's a few reasons for that. I, I think the primary reason is actually that we've been locking down user space so effectively. Um, so really, uh, gaining, act, gaining um, code execution in a root process uh, is significantly less useful than it used to be, and um, I, that's primarily due to SE Linux enforcement and the greater availability of Linux capabilities. Uh, and uh, Paul mentioned this earlier, but this year we hit a critical point where a majority of Android devices are now in SE Linux global enforcing mode. Uh, and so. Because of that, attackers are increasingly having to go straight for the kernel in order to disable SE Linux and circumvent, circumvent other kernel provided security mechanisms. Um, the other reason, well, partially because of the, um, the value of kernel bugs, we pay more for kernel bugs, and so we're, we're also rewarding uh, uh, security researchers accordingly. So uh, it, it's likely that people are looking for kernel bugs because we pay more for them. Uh, yeah, so this is an interesting data point. Uh, so Android does in fact inherit bugs from the upstream kernel, um, but our data shows that most of Android's kernel security vulnerabilities live in device drivers. Um, some of those device drivers do in fact come from the upstream kernel. Uh, so for example, um, a Wi-Fi driver. Um, but many of them are introduced by SOCs and uh, as well as other manufacturers. Um, this graph is, it's not intended as like a name and shame for vendors. Um, particularly because there, there doesn't seem to be one vendor who's doing really well and another one that's doing really poorly. Um, uh, they're really all doing poorly. And so... Um, do, you have, do you have a ratio of what's, uh, what's the ratio of drivers to core kernel? I don't, which would be a really useful data point. Yeah. Does, does anyone have that? I, I can tell you that is, it is, in fact, much less than 85%. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that would be that would be a useful data point. Um, yeah, so the, some other interesting things come out of this data. I, I think the first is is that, um, and we've kind of experienced this, which is that maintainers say, "Oh, bugs that you didn't inherit from upstream are not um, upstream's problem." Um, but I think. <laughs> Not I think, the reality is that this is what most of Linux systems look like. Uh, and it's not, it's not limited to Android devices. If I, um, most Linux systems are running at least some non-upstream code. And that includes your typical desktop distributions. Uh, if you want to uh, build the kernel for your Raspberry Pi, for example, you can't download an upstream kernel and build it and run it on your Raspberry Pi um, because it requires some device customization. Um, so anyway, the, the point being that this is, this is the, 
this is the reality, and so this is what we are trying to fix. Um, and what I think is important is that kernel defenses will protect both code that comes from upstream as well as out of tree vulnerabilities. And that, that's a really important point, right? Because uh, what we saw is that we do in fact receive, there are bugs in the core kernel and we need to protect against those bugs as well. So let's take a look at the types of bugs that we're seeing. Um, so by far our biggest problem is uh, bounce checking. Um, and that's primarily what I'm gonna focus on when we're looking at bugs by cause. Uh, and uh, we'll also take a brief look at the next two categories. So null pointer dereference is up there as well as information leak. Uh, another interesting way of looking at this data is breaking it down between uh, bugs that we've received from uh, vendor drivers and bugs that came from upstream. So there's a couple of really uh, interesting points that I wanna make about this. The first is that, um, well, they look very different. Um, so missing bounds checks, which uh, is a pretty simple bug to uh, fix and also to exploit is, is not as prevalent in the core kernel. But I'd also like to point out that the same categories exist in both, right? So we do actually have a problem with missing bounds checks uh, from the core kernel. Um, I think the only one that's missing is it looks like uh, we didn't have any integer overflows from the core kernel. Um, and that's not because there aren't any integer overflows in the core kernel, it's because they didn't impact Android devices. Um, so anyway, so yeah, the, the other interesting point is that, that I thought was, was that race conditions were the, the largest cause of bugs in the core kernel. Um, so I, what's interesting is that the type of bugs in the core kernel tend to be harder to exploit than the types that we're seeing in vendor drivers. Um, but uh, bugs from upstream are far more useful because they become universal exploits. Does that make sense? So a lot of these bugs, while silly bugs, are very, may only work on a single device, whereas um, a lot of the bugs that we're seeing from, um, from upstream are actually the ones that are um, desirable to attackers because they'll work on any device. So uh, <laughs> if it's not clear, uh, missing bounds check, checking uh, when you're copying information from user space is really sloppy programming. So, um, but it's happening. Um, so what I'd like, to, so um, let's look at some of the mitigations for here. And, and this was uh, one of my pieces of good news. And that's that mitigations for bounds checking are, have either landed or in the process of landing upstream. And so, um, so code that's happening and activity that's happening in the uh, kernel self-defense project and um, in the upstream kernel in general are addressing our largest class of bugs. Uh, so hardened user copy protects against incorrect bounds checking. Um, but I'd like to point out that hardened user copy is actually incomplete because uh, it's easily circumvented. The kernel can actually just read, read uh, user space addresses and so we need an additional protection to prevent the kernel from directly accessing user space without going through uh, the um, proper copy to from user functions. And so um, pan emulation, so pan is privilege access never, uh, specifically addresses that issue. And, uh, and that's currently up on the mailing list. I don't think it's landed, right? Okay, yeah, 
So uh, Kay said it landed for ARM32, and it's um, probably going to land for ARM64 in the next release. Um, so what's interesting about uh, PAN emulation is that it was actually included uh, in hardware for ARM version 8.1. Uh, the problem is, is that no one is using ARM version 8.1 yet. We're all, we're all still on ARM 8.0. And so this, this really kind of bridges that gap and allows us to have this feature before we, we even get the new uh, architecture update. So um, other mitigations that protect against incorrect bounds checking. So uh, stack protector protects against stack buffer overflows. Um, and then I've included some other features which don't directly address bounds checking, but they do make exploitation of, um, for example, heap overflows uh, more difficult. Uh, let's see here. Oh, and um, the other note was that for KSLR, um, So that obviously randomizes the location of the kernel, uh, but suddenly that makes information leaks such as kernel pointer leaks more important. And so um, in order to increase the, the value of KSLR, um, this community needs to be looking at how to make pointer leaks more difficult and other information leaks from the kernel. Uh, so for null pointer dereference, um, we already have our protection against that. It makes null pointer, um, the uh, LSM minimum address for mmapping makes null pointer dereferences unexploitable. It just turns them into crashes. Um, and, and we will also, uh, pan emulation will also make uh, null pointer dereferences uh, non-exploitable. So I've kind of struggled with how to frame this, uh, and I finally decided on calling it code review. And the point being that uh, the upstream code review process actually catches a lot of these bugs, and it's missing or uh, needs to be improved for out-of-tree code. Um, a lot of obvious security bugs could have been caught with better code review process. Not to push you on the spot here, but what, what about actually um, an initiative to get more of the code upstream? Yeah, so yeah, I'll talk about that a little bit. Um, yeah, well, so I ultimately decided not to include that here um, for a couple reasons. The, I, I think the main reason that we see on Android is that a lot of these drivers aren't for uh, features or that, they're not for functionality that you can just go out and buy. So for example, it, it might be for uh, a Wi-Fi chip or a sensor module or something like that, which is not, um, is not something you can just go buy and use. And so the, the value of having it in the upstream kernel where no one can actually use it um, seems somewhat limited to me. Um, I, I would also note that, um, as I said, some, some of these drivers are actually upstream, and being upstream did not necessarily improve the code quality of them, um, if that makes sense. Yeah? In addition to review, is there any initiative to get vendors to actually test the drivers? Yeah, so the, the question was, uh, uh, about getting vendors to test their code, fuzz their code, and the answer to that is yes, um, it's happening. It's happening both within Google and also from vendors. And so um, it, it's safe to say that, that uh, vendors are aware of this problem. So it's, it's not like they don't know that it, it's a problem, and so security practices are improving. Have you worked with the core infrastructure initiative at uh, Linux Foundation? I haven't, but other members of the team have. So um, for example, uh, members of my team are taking advantage of some of the fuzzing infrastructure that they're putting in um, and working on improving the, the quality of these drivers. Um, yeah, so anyway, what, what I wanted to look at was actually technical enforcement of better code. 
um, as opposed to um, getting people to do a better job, both, both of which are important, though. Um, so some technical changes that could be put in place. Um, I would like to see uh, better compiler changes, which actually catch bugs. Um, so I uh, another note was that uh, <laughs> pan emulation came up again, which is that uh, it actually forces developers to make proper use of, of uh, the copy to and from user functions. Um, and then KASAN um, is kind of what we're talking about, using testing to improve quality of code. So KASAN actually makes finding and fixing bugs uh, more efficient. Um, so we're, we're actually going to move on from bug cause. Any more questions with regard to bug cause? Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, we're going to look at attack surface reduction now. So it's actually, um, it's not a very popular topic, and yet it's an incredibly effective protection. Uh, so it has uh, multiple benefits. So making bugs unreachable obviously protects users, and that's the primary focus here is actually protecting users. Um, the other uh, benefit of reducing the attack surface is that we have people that are looking for bugs um, and using, uh, for example, fuzzing infrastructure. Well, with attack surface reduction, we can actually focus more of our resources on fewer entry points to the kernel, uh, basically allowing us to be more thorough in our process, in our bug hunting process. Um, Reducing the attack surface also makes incident response, for those who care about incident response, more efficient. Um, so for example, if someone reports a vulnerable IOCTL, uh, it takes a lot of time to actually figure out the reachability of that vulnerable IOCTL to see which process can reach it, um, which code paths can reach it. Um, so with policy languages like SecComp or SE Linux, uh, determining reachability of, of bugs actually becomes a lot easier. Um, also with the attack surface reduction, so on Android, we have a, uh, in general, we have a really good separation between uh, developer tools and, and regular use case. So from the kernel's perspective, we want to move developer tools that are provided by the kernel also into developer settings such that they're not reachable by default. Yeah, so let's look at um, categorize bugs now by driver. Um, something that's interesting is that uh, they all seem to be a problem. Um, one of the most interesting points of this is that, um, well, yeah. So, so my note here is important, which is that many of these bugs uh, are only reachable by a privilege process. So, yeah, let's let's actually break out the, break this out by bugs that are reachable by apps. Uh, so, Wi-Fi and GPU are still our top problems. Um, but you'll see now that the perf subsystem is also making a major contribution. So based on discussion on, on perf on the, on the mailing list, I, I would like to point out that um, the perf bugs were all introduced in vendor code. And so the, the, the perf maintainers, I'm sure, would like me to mention that. Um, <laughs> that they actually, they legitimately um, have good uh, security practices and are actively fuzzing their infrastructure. Um, so from a uh, bug fixing versus mitigation standpoint, I'd like to point out that we do fix all bugs. So whenever a bug is reported, we fix it. Uh, but, we but we also still want to add mitigations for that type of bug to make future bugs um, either less severe or 
uh, unreachable. So as I was digging through the Wi-Fi bugs, uh, an interesting trend emerged, which is that, um, and, and I think Wi-Fi is actually really interesting because a lot of these Wi-Fi drivers are in the upstream kernel. They're not just in uh, certain devices. Um, and it's that all of the bugs that were reachable by, by untrusted applications should have been protected by a capability check. Um, and so um, when, when I went through and categorized the cause of bugs, I had things like you know, missing bounds checks or uh, missing permissions checks. Well, a lot of these bugs were actually multiple, multiple causes or you know, it took a missing permission check and then an integer or then a, a missing bounds check in order to exploit. Um, so in cases where multiple bugs uh, were the case, I just had to choose one that I categorized by. Um, but anyway, so, so this brings up a really important security concept, which is that uh, relying on encode checks, particularly, particularly scattered all throughout a code base, is bad security design. So we actually want security checks to be done up front and we want them to be auditable. So the other fun discovery that we made when it came to Wi-Fi driver bugs is that they were reachable by local Unix sockets, which I have no idea why you should be able to reach the Wi-Fi driver through a Unix socket, but you could. Uh, and so uh, when we're looking at mitigations, we're gonna look at how we added uh, much stronger policy around all socket types. Uh, so looking at kernel entry point, um, I, I don't think anyone's too surprised to see this. May, maybe, maybe, how, <laughs> maybe the scope of it is surprising, which is that ioctals were by far the largest problem and, and um, really any syscall, so, well, yeah. What I'd like to point out is that syscalls that are commonly modified by vendors were the largest problem. Uh, yeah? Um, yeah, so, let's see here. I'm, I'm wondering why that is listed here in the first place. Ah, yes, so I'm actually gonna address that, which is that's um, some of the mitigations that went into, actually, not just Android M, but also Android M, were uh, heavy restrictions on debug FS. So, um, because, as I said, these bugs go all the way back to 2014, many of these have, have been addressed um, by the mitigations that we're discussing. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. So, let's see here. Yeah, so uh, for mitigations, because, why, because the ioctal, ioctal syscall was such a major problem, uh, it's actually the big reason why we added ioctal command whitelisting, which is so that we can cut back on which ioctals are accessible and we can actually audit which ioctals are accessible. Uh, so we added it to, uh, probably the biggest one was Wi-Fi. Um, so originally hundreds of ioctal commands were accessible and we brought that down to 29 whitelisted uh, network socket ioctal, ioctals. Um, for Unix sockets we did the same thing, although it went down from hundreds to, I think we have eight that are whitelisted. And then we also disallowed ioctals on all other socket types, including generic sockets and uh, Netlink sockets. Uh, GPU is actually really interesting because um, I didn't really expect that we'd be able to use ioctal whitelisting on GPUs because why would you have ioctal commands that aren't being used? Um, but it turns out that, at least when I looked at the KGSL ioctals, um, which are from Qualcomm, that generally only about half of the commands were needed. Um, so when I looked into that, uh, because that seems strange to me, um, 
it appears that uh, the reason for that has to do with compatibility. So you have a version of your driver, and then you have a version of your library. And they don't nece necessarily assume um, which version you're using of the library. And so uh, they have to um, keep all of these ioctals exposed for compatibility reasons. Uh, what's nice is that on Android, that's not the case. The library is part of the system image. Apps and other processes have to use the version of the library provided by the system. Um, so we could actually do uh, whitelisting on ioctal commands. Um, and it turns out that when uh, we looked at bugs that were being reported and bugs that were reachable, they were you know, roughly equivalent to the number of ioctal commands that were um, exposed. In other words, if we cut off 50% of the ioctal commands exposed, we would generally cut off about 50% of the bugs that were reachable. Uh, other mitigations, so we restricted access to perf. Uh, access to perf event open is disabled by default, and for developers that need access to perf, they can, they can re-enable it through developer settings. Uh, we removed all uh, access to uh, debug FS, which, as someone pointed out, is a reasonable response. Um, we also removed most app access to sys. So any files that apps need in uh, the sys file system have to be whitelisted. And then um, we backported setcomp. I believe we backported it all the way to 3.4, the 3.4 kernel. Um, and so setcomp is a requirement for all devices. There's no, no exemptions. Um, and yeah, we, we actually used it on the platform as well to, to constrain some of the media server processes. So mini jail shout out for that, because um, if, if you've never used setcomp before but are considering using it, I mean, I probably constrained a couple processes in, a, you know, in an afternoon. It was, it was really simple. So the impact of the mitigations, so because most of the bugs are, are uh, driver specific or device specific, uh, we have to actually look at per device. So uh, the, the device I chose was Shamu. So for Shamu, 100% um, of the Wi-Fi bugs were blocked, 50% uh, of the GPU bugs were blocked, 100% and for debug FS and perf. So again, showing the effectiveness of attack surface reduction, these were all the largest areas of bugs that we had, and we were able to just uh, remove access to those without actually impacting um, uh, what users see. So uh, gaps, so there's a lot of functionality in the kernel that, um, not everyone needs access to. And what we really need is we need an, a, the capability to turn access on or off when we need it. And there's actually been a lot of pushback on adding these type of controls. Um, so you know, no, no one wants their feature turned off, even if there are uh, use cases where people don't need that feature. And so, um, yeah. So uh, the other thing that I'd like to see is argument inspection for setcomp. So the way setcomp works right now is you can do uh, filtering on uh, the first, uh, it's architecture dependent, but on the first few arguments that are passed into uh, a function, sometimes those are pointers. And doing our, uh, argument filtering on pointers is not very useful. We need to know what they're actually pointing at. And so uh, Case talked about argument inspection, so that's, that's something that we would like to see. Um, so for future work, so this kind of harkens back to last year's keynote speech where he compared uh, computer safety with the car industry years ago. Um, we, need, we need more and we need better safety features, and with it in mind that sometimes these may cause inconvenience for developers, we, we still need them. And uh, you know, we, we can balance what developers have access to with what goes on to systems like Android or um, 
ties in or, or other operating systems. All right, so uh, on all my graphs, we always had a large other section. So uh, looking at other potentials for attack surface reduction. Uh, so Android uh, libc is called Bionic. And what's interesting about Bionic is that it breaks out only a subset of the syscalls provided by the kernel. And so um, any syscall that's not uh, broken out by Bionic is uh, a candidate for um, removing access to. So um, the other, uh, <laughs> I'll go ahead and touch this third rail. Um, so all, not all, most, most of our bugs are, are caused by memory safety. And so if we could look at a way of either making C uh, more memory safe, and uh, there actually has been work on this, or uh, the ability to use something that is memory safe in the kernel. So for example, if we could uh, restrict vendors to only using a memory safe language, then that would fix a lot of our bugs or it wouldn't even fix them. They just wouldn't be able to occur. All right, so where do we go from here? So uh, a lot of really, really good work is happening in the kernel self-protection project, and it's, it's uh, being done by people in this room. Um, the, the other people I'd like to point out that have been really helpful um, and have been getting some really great features in are people at ARM and Lenaro have been getting some really, really great security features in. And uh, Android is gonna benefit greatly from, from those people's hard work. Um, from an open source perspective, uh, Google really wants, and Android really wants, these features to go into the upstream kernel. And it's because in the upstream kernel, lots and lots of people, everyone gets to benefit from security features. Uh, you know, as opposed to just Android trying to, to go its own way and, and customizing the kernel itself. And really, that's, that's responsible open source development, is uh, participating with the community. Um, yeah, so other areas that I think are, uh, have some more low-hanging fruit, attack surface reduction still has a lot of low-hanging fruit. Um, so please, uh, make contributions to AOSP, um, and then, as always, continue to find and fix bugs. It's gonna be really exciting as those uh, bounds checks, um, mitigations get submitted into Android. It's gonna be really exciting to see that category just fall off the map, but then we're obviously gonna have new categories which become our, our largest source of bugs, and so, um, Continuing to find bugs in those places and submit fixes will both uh, help us obviously fix individual bugs, but then also um, give us data on what, uh, what areas we need to work on. And with that, questions? Yeah, Casey? Yeah, so Um, so, so uh, debugfs was, well, the ones that I did name were, are the ones that stick out right away. Debugfs are, uh, is something that's useful on debug builds, and so that's where it should be accessible. Um, perf was actually a really good example of, of something that actually is important and that we do want access to, but not all the time. And so adding, we added a toggle into Android, and there's discussions on how to do something similar uh, in the upstream kernel. Um, looking at that long list of, of or the, the list of system calls that were available through Bionic. Um, so a, a good example was uh, sysvipc. That's something that we, that we completely removed access to in Android. Um, and we actually, that's a restriction that we now place on across the ecosystem is, is no sysvipc. Um, so yeah, anyone have any other? Anyway, the, the, yeah, this, this is an area that has some low-hanging fruit, and so we're looking at it. 
Yeah, so the question was about getting some help from compilers. So the, the GCC plugin infrastructure just got accepted and so into the upstream kernel, and so that's, that's going to make creating those sorts of plugins a lot easier, and so that's some good news. Um, are there any specific ones that have gone in that Any other questions? All right, yeah, so this, this is kind of a fun talk because I feel like we're looking at the dark past and also looking at the bright future, especially as we see a lot of these really, uh, really good kernel defenses making their way in that actually address some of our largest issues. Um, yeah, it's, it's exciting, so thank you. <laughs>